said I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Do you believe me? It doesn't matter what I believe, I'm gonna do my job. Directed by debutant filmmaker Anthony Mandler, Monster is a courtroom drama film that depicts a young man's pursuit of justice in an inherently biased legal system. Without sympathy, do not, do not let these people play on your sympathies. Steve Harmon, Kelvin Harrison Jr., is an honor student at New York's prestigious Stuyvesant Public High School. He has loving parents, Jennifer Hudson and Jeffrey Wright, who are actively involved in his life. Steve aspires to be a filmmaker and can often be spotted exploring his neighborhood in Harlem and elsewhere in New York with an analog camera or his phone. His life forever changes when he is accused of being part of a deadly bodega armed robbery. Funding to these smaller communities. Yeah, sure. No, no problem. I'll just meet you there. Yeah. Okay. All right. His subsequent trial serves as the main plot device in the film. Here is everything you need to know about Monster's ending. Spoilers ahead. The narrative in Monster is not linear, it goes back and forth between the time before Steve's arrest and the time during his trial. Steve lives a happy, if somewhat sheltered life, with his parents and younger brother Jerry. He has inherited the artistic sensibilities of his father, who is an artist and seems to be involved in the advertising industry. At Stuyvesant, Steve is part of the film club and has a wonderful relationship with the teacher who runs it, Leroy Sawicki, Tim Blake Nelson. Two additional participants volunteered to be involved in the crime. Volunteered. He has great friends and even a budding romance with the fellow film club member Renee Pickford, Lovi Simone. Mr. Sawicki tells Steve and other students that a filmmaker has an incessant need to tell their story and urges them to find theirs. While searching for the story he wants to tell, Steve becomes acquainted with William King, ASAP Rocky or Rackham Mayers, a local criminal. means you to keep it inside. You ache with the desire to write it, film it, share it. I mean Having spent all his life in the neighborhood, Steve knows exactly who King is and he is justifiably guarded around the older man. But he also knows that he can't afford to downright refuse King either, as there is always a chance of violent repercussions. Check out your beloved King one time out here. As for King, it's clear that he sees Steve as his latest target for grooming. He even helps Steve improve as a storyteller by guiding him to an unfiltered look at their neighborhood. After their arrests, only Steve and King are set to be tried because the other two accused, King's cousin Richard Bobo Evans, John David Washington, Annis Baldo, Gerald Jerome, have accepted plea deals. I thought of all the scenes of your life. You playing football, just like I did. Representing Steve during the trial is the overworked public defender Catherine O'Brien, Jennifer Eel. Even though she may not completely believe that Steve is innocent, she defends him to the best of her ability during the trial. As Steve realizes that his future almost entirely hinges on making the jury believe in his character. You know I auditioned for LaGuardia. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I could be in one of your movies. You could real. be in one of my movies. Yeah. He teaches himself to hide his fears well in the court and project a version of himself that is confident in his rendition of the truth. Div Carol. Were there any signs of life in the victim's body when you arrived? No. I do my shopping on Tuesdays, and as I was coming up the street, I saw a boy. That boy there. Is Steve guilty? Steve's actions do indeed lead to the death of the bodega owner Aguinaldo Nesbitt. As revealed in the last part of the film, King stops Steve on his way home from school and forces him to go inside the bodega and see if anyone else is there besides Nesbitt. I didn't run away. He and Bobo also tell him to give them a signal. Steve knows what is about to happen, but his sheer fear of King and Bobo prevents him from asserting his refusal, running away, or even telling Nesbitt that his business is about to be hit by robbers. As he goes in, he sees Isvaldo standing a few meters away. Evidently, everyone except Steve is there with the intention to rob the place. As Steve comes out of the bodega, he raises his hand toward the afternoon sun. A witness sees this, and the police later claim, that this was his way of signaling King and Bobo. 
During his testimony, Steve claims that he did that out of habit as an aspiring filmmaker. Prosecution ready? Yes, Your Honor. Defense? Ready, Your Honor. The film seems to be consciously ambiguous about this. Because if he does that to signal King and Bobo, he consciously does something that results in Nesbitt's death. But if it is unintentional, then it just means that King and Bobo just presume that he is signaling them. This doesn't particularly erase Steve's guilt. He will likely carry that burden for the rest of his life. We think Steve lifts his hand unconsciously to get a sense of the light, just as he has done countless times before. Immediately after showing him and the sun through his fingers, the camera focuses on a moving train and a flock of pigeons. This likely implies that Steve momentarily forgets his circumstances and becomes immersed in the urban beauty around him. But that reverie is soon broken and the reality takes over once again. However, the brief respite that the break offers allows Steve to garner enough courage to run away finally and not look back. How does Steve prove his innocence in court? If I tell what happened. The film asserts that it doesn't matter whether a person is guilty or not, the most important thing is whether their guilt can be proven in court. Although the U.S. law states that a person is not guilty until they are convicted in a court, certain stigmas automatically seem to get attached if a defendant is from the African-American community, like Steve is. The prosecutor, Paul Ben Victor, even directly calls both Steve King monsters. And the defendant, Steve Harmon, not guilty of all charges. Good luck, young man. So, he fights an uphill battle against a system that is deeply entrenched in institutional prejudice. As O'Brien tells him, his testimony determines how he will spend a chunk of his future. Both O'Brien and his cellmate, Sunset, Nas, help him understand what is in store for him during his testimony. Mr. Sawicki has previously taught him that truth can be multifaceted. Equipped with all these instructions, he presents himself as a confidant, an assertive individual and stays resolutely truthful to his version of the truth. Now, still feel the eyes of the guards on me as I sleep. I have to grab a hold of the air around me sometimes to remind myself. After all, he hardly knows King. The latter's conviction will not impact him in any way. Trapped by his own testimony, King can't refute anything that Steve says. I really, I really got My man, stop fucking playing with me, B. That ass, man. Go ahead, go in there. It ain't gonna take no time. Nigga, I got your bike. You good, man. Go ahead, nigga. So, when Steve says that he didn't know that King and Bobo would rob the bodega, King and his lawyer can't do anything despite knowing it to be blatantly false. My client, Steve Harmon, had nothing to gain by being involved with this robbery. Combined with that of Mr. Sawicki, Steve's testimony successfully projects him to the jury as a brilliant and talented young man who was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. This has as big of an impact on the trial as it does because it is unequivocally true. As a result, even though King gets convicted, Steve receives a not guilty verdict.